started. So first we have reproducible research and their data. Um, let's see, is it Thomas or I sharing the screen to start? I thought I am sharing. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so here we go. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Thomas, what does reproducible research mean to you? <laughs> reproducible research, is, uh, to me, means essentially that, um, at least on a, at least for computational things, they should be, um, yeah, they, they, there should, there should be enough information to reproduce them as precisely as possible. That includes uh, software being used, hardware being used, um, and similar similar things, uh, so that I can, well, at least have an idea if something is different, what might be the reason for it. Mm -hmm. So, should we go to motivation? Yep. Yes. And do you want to zoom in and make the web browser a bit bigger until we... Sure. So this is a great comic. Let's take a few seconds to read it. And what, what yeah. So I actually sort of had the opposite experience. Someone told me this idea that, okay, the best possible project to get is something where you have some small model and you write all the code yourself. And yeah. Well, um, um, I, I would argue that the best uh, is a well-documented project, but uh, yeah. it's one of the most difficult to uh, to get. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I want to say about that comic is that really, you can also replace Professor Smith by future self, <laughs> and the PhD student by self, because mm -hmm. the, this this will be kind of the situation that you might be in if you didn't properly document didn't properly stay save your information about what you're doing and you're coming back to a project after some time mm -hmm. yeah so who's ever had this case where or known of someone in this case where they say oh i have to do uh submit revisions to this paper but i can't make the figures again and the results look different I think there might be no worse feeling than this. I think I've heard it from most of the people I know. <laughs> I, I've had something yeah. similar, yeah. Yeah. So what we learn today is hopefully going to help prevent that from happening. So if we scroll down, what is reproducible research? Well, well... I guess you can read the quote as well as we can, but it says the results can be duplicated. And I guess the main point is that if results can't be duplicated, it's not even science, right? Yeah, it, it, or like, it's at least not useful science. <laughs> yeah. And there might, there might be experiments where you are just, you just don't have the material anymore, uh, so it can't be repro reproduced but mm -hmm. it might still be science it's just yeah. probably not very useful yeah and we had this icebreaker discussion about should science be reproducible and it seems like it depends on what which is a quite interesting philosophical question and i guess there's a difference between the exact answer and the same overall results so yeah. Is science reproducible these days? Unfortunately, not. Um, uh, and to me, um, I, I can understand. Well, I can much more accept uh, it not being um, exactly reproducible in biology or chemistry or practical fields where you have practical experiments where so many things can change. Mm. But in computational fields, and even there, it's some. It's often enough not 
properly reproducible. I really can't understand why. Yeah. So where do you think these things come from? Like, is it that the same program with the same input give different results or in computation, um, is it? In, com in computation, I think it's partially due to um, bad documentation and therefore uh, difficulty to um, know what actually went in. Mm -hmm. um, left out steps in pre-processing mm -hmm. in some way, so sloppy writing. Um, and um, yeah, not recording what you what environment you used properly. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, and these are all the things we're going to talk about later today. But really, or just tomorrow or tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, well, really all last week and all this week. <laughs> but like really look at that figure. It says only 10% of people in the survey thought there was not a reproducibility crisis. Is it well, that kind well, of 3%, crazy? Um, 7 well, okay, 7% weren't sure. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> so even in the best possible case, like, yeah. And if you're new to computational research, I think this will start um, looking really familiar really soon. Okay, there's these factors, which I guess we've talked about. Um, hmm. Do we need to mention the levels of reproducibility any? Well, we essentially will go through them um, during yeah, the lecture. I guess so. And I guess from the, the environment code and yeah. so on, yeah. And I guess the main point here is that just the article is not enough. Like if you, you can publish an article that says the method you used, but there's a whole lot more that you could use that can make it even more reproducible rather than programming something oneself. Yeah. Hmm. Then we have the different levels of reproducibility, Yeah. kind of. Um, how reproducible do you want it? Um, if it's yeah. just... Is it enough to have the same data, same analysis, and just get the same result? Or mm. do you want it to also be possible to, uh, to apply to different things and give either, mm. either the same kind of results or similar results? Or... Mm -hmm. And yeah. achieving generalizable is difficult. Yeah. So I guess basically this is the difference between running the same thing and someone else being able to reuse it for a different problem and still yeah. work somehow. Okay, so and at the end of the page we have a discussion in HackMD, but we basically did that as part of the icebreaker. So should we go on to organizing projects? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, we ha we have started with um, Git last week, and so keeping almost anything that's not, or and e and even the large data files into science, some kind of ver versioning system is definitely uh, very useful. Mm -hmm. And but even within the project, you should kind of keep to some structure that is that makes it clear where what is so that you can find it again and that it's not difficult to track down a certain piece of information. Yeah. Um, so how do you organize your directories? Do you, do you um, follow this kind of plan here? Roughly. Um, I commonly have some kind of source. Uh, my documentation uh, is most often part of the source code itself, uh, and the doc it might be well. It, for larger projects, yes, there's a there's its own documentation uh, folder. Otherwise, it's very often just uh, the information in the README. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same um, for me. Like. Usually. Uh, I, I think th th this this structure is pretty much for a quite large project. For a small project, I would say source is important, the readme is important, important, and your data. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually uh, something that might be really difficult because often enough your data is located somewhere else. Yeah. Which which makes it really difficult uh, to keep this all packed together. So 
maybe having a readme in the data where the data is located and what data to use is more useful than actually having the data in spe in place uh, in mm -hmm. your project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so would you track the whole project name directory with git or would you track the like manuscript source and doc separately um I would probably uh, okay. I, I I would probably keep the source. Um, okay. Now 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 this 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 depends a little bit. If if you are large enough that you have have your own real documentation um, uh, folders that you that you are actually having a separate documentation, mm -hmm. um, then I would keep them together probably. Yeah. Uh, the manuscript I would probably not have in the same folder, mm -hmm. or yeah. not under the same version control at least, uh, yeah. rather somewhere else. Because um, while I think the source can potentially be opened quite quickly, uh, my manuscript files and how I want to publish that might not, uh, well, might look very strange if they are um, published before any kind of release. Yeah, yeah. Because there might things that uh, might be things that change. Um, processed data should not be, probably not be tracked anyways, um, because yeah. it's intermediary data most often. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And data, yeah, well, tracked, yes, but um, probably uh, probably in a, not directly in the same Git repository. Yeah. Well. Or, or okay. a large file storage somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Should we go on? The next section is what we just discussed, so reproducible publications. So I guess this is not the main point of what we're talking about in this workshop, but there are tools for this. Like, for example, did you know Overleaf has Git integration, which is I haven't cool. used Overly for quite some time, so uh, no, I didn't actually. Yeah. I didn't. Um, let's see. And there's lots of other tools which we're going to talk about partly tomorrow, partly later. Hmm. Um, so while we're going over the questions, I propose that you all look at this example word count project. There's some good questions in HackMD. Uh, there's a good point there. You have to pay for Git integration now. Yeah, I think maybe my university has the university license or whatever, so we have it. But yeah, I think I did read that. Uh, there's a question in HackMD. I'm using Python. Main script and notebook script. The main script or notebook and another script with only the functions. Um, yeah, so making, I'd say that what you're doing sounds fairly good. At least that's a good starting point. As it gets larger, you can start making these functions a Python package itself, which we don't really go into much detail in this workshop, but yeah. Okay, so word count, what do we see in here? Mm, are we looking? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just uh, cloned it. Oh, uh, well, created one, uh, created my copy from the template. So. This is the word count example. Okay. So which parts do we see in here? Do we see? Um, we see a source, which they call source instead of SRC. Yeah. Um, they the do source. have processed data as an mm -hmm. uh, as a as their own folder. It's, it's essentially yeah. it's pre, it's prepared. It, it can be there as a, as an empty folder, yes. Mm -hmm. So that it's just prepared for uh, for use. They have the results. They do have the manuscript in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. So yeah. 
and mm. yeah, let's clone it. Okay. Can we take so, a sneak preview at the environment in StakeMake files? The yes. exercise suggests that. This is the environment.yaml. Can you zoom in a little bit? Okay, good. So what does this look like? Dependencies. This looks like a problem if you want to create it, uh, uh, at least for everyone who is already set up, because the name is conflicting with the environment uh, that we have for Code Refinery. Um, so we let, let, let's assume that our environment has this has the information or the stuff that is needed here, even though it probably is slightly different. Yeah. Um, so it basically yeah. says what packages. Which actually, this is the topic of the next lesson. Yeah. Um, what about the snake file? The uh, wow. View. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the snake file. Um, this is. Well, we will discuss it in more detail later. Um, there is a lot of information in here uh, on how to run this project, how to run the different steps in here. Yeah. Starting with defining some data, defining different rules. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess we'll, we're actually going to talk about this in yeah. two lessons and there'll be a big exercise on this. So, would you consider this project to be reproducible? Overall, I think so, yes. Yeah, I mean, if it tells you what as, as As reproducible as um, possible. The, the only <laughs> thing that I'm actually, well, that I would be missing here is what this, what, um, what architecture this was run on, if it would be an article. Mm, you mean like Intel versus Interverse or even the processor types, yeah. if available. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, well, this this has nothing to do with numerics, but if it comes to numerics things, um, then that is kind of information might be useful. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Um. Oops. That was not. Yeah. So should we go on then? Now we so. are going to the recording dependencies. And there is a request to not scroll up and down so much and so fast. Sorry. So, um, let's see. Should we, well, what's this 10 year challenge? How many people have code that's 10 years old and you think you could still run it? <laughs> so Thomas, yeah. can any of your code from 10 years ago work? Let, let, let think. Uh, uh, some of it would be re would probably be really difficult because a lot of the stuff was in MATLAB, and MATLAB and getting the old MATLAB versions might be mm. difficult. Or the correspond it was linear programming, and the corresponding solvers might not be available mm. anymore in the specific versions. Yeah. And yeah, I had these numerical issues um, quite a lot in the field that I was working in uh, mm -hmm. because. It was uh, optimization of linear programs, and slight changes could lead to a slightly different optimum being being found, yeah. and then further steps could, well, just be wrong. Yeah. Or not mm -hmm. wrong, but well, different. Mm -hmm. So, so in my case, I was very carefully sort of packed in lots of my things into one Python package, but it's all Python 2 and all depends on each other so much that I think it will probably never run again. But that's not the main point of this lesson, I guess. So this little picture you see here, the idea is there's all these different ways of installing things in Python and they all somehow relate and it can become a complete chaos. If you scroll down a little bit, it makes this joke that the la yeah. laptop is Sorry. a Superfund site. So Superfund is a United States name for a thing that's based 
specifically for cleaning up heavily polluted uh, sites that have no one responsible for them anymore. Okay, let's go down to the conda and anaconda section. So these are all different ways of recording the dependencies and installing them. So what's a dependency? Maybe we should define that. Dependency is a software package that um, your code needs to run. Okay. Yeah. So basically, like if you are running something in Python and it needs NumPy, NumPy is a dependency. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So which of these dependency managers do you use for Python? Um, personally, Conda. Okay. Almost exclusively. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's it's the most versatile. Um, so it's not only for Python. It uh, or it can also provide environments for other um, programming languages. Um, you can essentially uh, build a lot of things with Conda. Mm -hmm. You get you get your own C plus plus compilers if you mm -hmm. want, um, and a lot of additional stuff. So it's very versatile and. Yeah, I'm not only using it for uh, Python. So yeah, okay. And I mostly use pip in virtual event just because my stuff is not that complicated. Okay, <laughs> so let's look at this exercise here, which is really more of a discussion. So let's make a um, place in the hackmd. Um, so we have four different ways of tracking dependencies here. Uh, um, well, the, A is not really a way of tracking dependencies. Um, depending on things and not mentioning them anywhere is not really tracking. Yeah. Should we give a few minutes for people to write in HackMD what they think? Or should we just um, talk? Maybe we can just yeah. talk. Yeah. Anyway, in HackMD here, please write your own thoughts on this discussion, A, B, C, and D. And I guess we can be um, discussing at the same time. Yeah. So, so how many times these days do you find someone that doesn't say its dependencies? No, it is actually rarely because um, so many thing. Well, so many toolbox or so many program languages uh, or deployment um, methods depend on something like that. For example, um, well, in in Python, at least any project that um, wants to be used has these kind of things because you don't you don't want to figure out um, mm -hmm. all the stuff on your own and if you would have to um, probably most people would just say um nope <laughs> i'm not going to use it yeah um in uh for web development javascript things uh packages do need to have their pa their package json um mm -hmm. so the stuff needs to be defined otherwise it, otherwise the whole deployment uh, me, uh tools just don't work mm -hmm. um so yeah I would say it's very it's it has become a lot rarer to to find these things. Um, mostly people who are currently still in development of their of their small code and haven't published anything haven't really really published it yet. Yeah. Okay. I would say. Yeah. And what about B versus C? Um. Did we, did we say what requirement.txt actually is? Um, I don't think we said so. Uh, requirements.txt is mainly for virtual environments, uh, not so much for Conda, for all I know. Yeah. Conda commonly uses YAML files. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a file with one name per line, and these can be automatically installed. And so it normally uses pip to install. Essentially, uh, you can put a pip install in front of uh, each of these lines, yeah. and that's what it would do. Yeah. 
So what's the difference between B and C? Um, well, B is essentially just saying, well, this this package, I don't care. I don't really care about the version, um, except that, well, or I take the latest version, the latest version possible, kind of. Mm -hmm. That is what B is essentially saying. Yeah. And C is uh, defining which versions it actually, uh, and precisely which versions it actually wants, even from mm -hmm. the Git repositories. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly with Git, uh, if you, it might be worth, it might actually sometimes be worth if you really depend on a specific version of something uh, to have a fork and point to your own repository. Mm -hmm. Because that's the kind of only way you can be sure that this commit will stay. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes projects do change the history, which, especially when it comes to tax. Mm -hmm. Should not, but does happen. So, yeah. And then D, well, everything. So if there's just the name and not the Git address, it finds it from the center repository called the Python package index. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, should we... Yeah continue down. So let's, um, I guess let's not talk about these things too much because let's face it, you're probably going to have to read it anyway and people asked for more time for exercises. So basically the idea is with Python and pip, there's commands you can run that can install packages from these requirements files and it works automatically which is nice. Conda has the same thing. Yeah. So I think Thomas had said this already, but it's really important to emphasize, I think, that there's not just, um, Conda is not just for Python. It works for Python, R, C stuff, probably Julia things. I guess it doesn't work for MATLAB. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's just too big. Um, but yeah, any any open software, any open yeah. programming language uh, where someone has put the packages on the Conda or on Conda Forge, yeah. you could use with Conda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if we keep scrolling down, let's just go straight to the exercise. Yeah. So. Now you have a chance to explore these things. So let's give you, say, maybe five minutes, seven minutes to play with some of these commands. Um, and I guess you can work with Conda or you can explore anything else on the page here. And yeah, let's take questions by Hackandy. So let's, yeah, let's just go and have fun with this. Okay, see you in a bit. Uh, let's say seven or eight minutes. Yes. Okay, bye. Hello, we're back. Let's look at HackMD quickly. So there were some good questions here. Um, Thomas, any particular ones you'd like to highlight? Um, say... the, the one that I want to highlight is what is the difference between Conda and Mamba mm -hmm. and which one to use? Uh, Mamba is a precise replacement. In any place where you can um, write Conda, whatever, you can write Mamba, whatever. And um, the only real difference is that Mamba's um, re um, dependency resolution mechanism is a lot faster than Conda. Mm -hmm. So personally, I'm for any uh, environment creation, I'm always using Mamba. Yeah. I have stopped using Conda Create mm -hmm. for quite some time now because it, in comparison, just takes ages. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? There was a really good question here 
that I'd recommend you read. We don't have time to go over it, but the idea is that with Conda, you export a YAML file that defines the environment very exactly, and then that environment can't be recreated on another system, or maybe even the same system. And this is a really good philosoph philosophical debate between exactness and then reusability in a different context. Um, let's see. Yeah, the rest I think you can read separately. Uh, I'll take it back to Thomas's screen and we can quickly view. So at the bottom of the page, there's other dependency management tools, which we can't really go well, into too much detail. At least you probably don't want to hear us talk about things when you can read the list. So let's, how about we just not do it? Um, but it seems that all these modern languages are getting this kind of thing. So somehow dependency management is just really critical in order to do um, modern work. So not just installing stuff, but being able to install different sets of things for different projects. So um, let's see. Um, there's a question on HackMD, why not Anaconda? So Anaconda is sort of the distribution of things and it uses Conda as the package manager. So basically we, um, how do you say it? So we use, anyway, whichever one you use, you use Conda or Mamba to make the new environment. Uh, is there anything else we should say before our break? I'm going back to HackMD. There's a good question here. I always want run into problems when I want to update Spider or package something. Conda simply doesn't want to update. I usually do pip update or follow instructions. Any advice? I think this is something that I didn't say earlier, but it might be written. So whenever you define your requirements, either in the conda environment or requirements.txt or whatever it is in your package, when you get these kind of problems, my solution is, okay, I delete the environment and I make it again from the definition. So basically, instead of needing to update, which, um, you know, you're in some existing state, you need to update who knows what needs to change and all kinds of things can go wrong. When environments become the kind of thing where if there's ever a problem, you delete it and make it again, then that simplifies a whole lot of things. So there's only one place you have to debug. You have to debug a new environment creation and figure out what requirements you need. And that is, yeah, that sort of transforms the way that you do work. Okay, so now we have a 10 minute break and then we come back for the recording computational steps exercise where we'll look at snake make. In here, our goal is to have a really brief intro, intro and a lot of time for you to work independently and then a brief conclusion. Um, yeah, okay, great. So see you in 10 minutes. Bye. And we're back. So now we are going to recording computational steps and there is the link here. I will share my screen and we see that we are here on their recording computational steps. So what's the main point here? So when you're running code, you can either go and type things yourself or it can be automatic. And the more automatic it is, the more reproducible it can be. 
and the easier it is to do it later. And we're going to see different ways to do this. So the idea of this part, we're going to have a very brief introduction. We will send you to exercises and you can explore yourself and then a very brief wrap up. Since people have asked for more time to do exercises, well, I think this is a great one to do that in. So first off, there's this exercise preparation. It's actually the same word count repository that we were looking at before. But when the exercise starts, you will do this. Um, or you can already start working on it. So we've already gone over the contents of the thing. So let's keep going down and let's look at how the program works. So there's these input files like this isles.txt. So you run a command to generate the statistics. You can run a command to make the plot and you can run a command to make the summary. And they have to be run in the right order. And if either the code changes or one of the input files change, then you might need to rerun one, two, or three of these commands. Does this sound familiar? Yep, yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, so for one book, it's easy. For two books, it's easy. For three, it's probably easy. But what if you have to go to 3,000? Let's discuss how to do this. So one is a graphical interface, or even something like, well, let's say graphical interface. So if you had to do this for 3,000 books, that would be a lot of clicking for things. And basically, it just doesn't work. So for some interfaces, it might be possible to do some sort of scripting or to um, make it a bit more automatic. But for the most part, you know, I think you'll quickly run into some sort of things you can't do. What do you think? Admittedly, I would say if it's a well-programmed graphical user interface, you could probably select all thousand um, books <laughs> for yeah. the first step and the rest is done automatically. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah. If... But yeah. Okay. So what's the next possible level? So we can do it manually. So this is four books here. So you notice we run two commands over and over. And these commands are, well, the same we saw above, and then a summary, which looks at all three books. So the biggest problem here is that, well, if you want to rerun just one book, you have to find the right commands yourself. And what happens if one of these file names is wrong? Then, I mean, all your results are wrong and you might never notice. And that's pretty bad. But the point here is that the command line interface is sort of the universal interface to things. The next level is doing it as a script. So here notice this one line, it's a for loop. And this is in the bash language, the same that the command line uses. So this is a fairly easy way to run things over and over again. Okay. But finally, and this is the point of the exercise, is a workflow management tool like Snakemake. So it's just one. This is the one the lesson uses. There's many more, but let's look at how it works. So there's one command up here that shows it says glob wildcards data book. So basically it finds all of the different books that are in the source directory. So we don't even need to define what the input data is. It finds it. And then we define rules. So for example, here there's a count words rule and it cl clearly defines, okay, here's the inputs. There's the source code and then the file name. Here's the output. Here's a log file. And here's what should actually run Python input word count or Python, the Python script name, the input file name and the output file name. And then it sends some stuff to the log. 
Okay. Uh, so once we define all these things, it basically makes a graph of what needs to run. So it says, okay, for all these outputs, we need to run all these inputs and maybe we need to make these plots and other things. So we could talk about snake files for a long time, but we basically don't have time now. So we basically assume that this works as it is. And we will let you explore it yourself. Um, we will run snake make like this. So snake make, we delete all outputs and run it again. The J option says run only one thing at once. And you will explore these things in the exercises yourself. So I won't go talking about it. And let's talk about why snake make later and all these things. This is all for you to read. Here's an example of what it's actually doing. Oops, sorry. So we say if we want to run everything, it will say, okay, we need to run all of these word counts, all of these plots on each things, the test, and then combine it. And if we change just one input file, it can detect, okay, I only need to rerun this step, this step, and this step. Okay. So I'm going to put this discussion question in the HackMD, but then let's send you to exercises. So we end at uh, half past the hour. Um, and yeah, so basically take what we said and explore yourself and write questions in HackMD and we will discuss your questions afterwards. Okay. Good luck. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Hello, we are back. Um, so we've got a few minutes. Let's look at some of the talks here. There was this great question about struggling to see the purpose of snake make. Yeah, do you want to hear me? <laughs> um, okay, the, I would say the purpose of snake make um, is to avoid duplicate um, duplicate jobs and still being able to put in additional inputs. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the in this instance well, that we have now, hmm? but go ahead. Oh. In the instance that we have now, you could add additional books, and the only things that need to run to redo it um, would be the additional books. The, the, the other books are already finished. They are already computed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you would, and you could still then produce the combined zip file from all the inputs. And if you imagine that for a large project where you have additional computation steps, um, you can incrementally update your, your information and you don't need to rerun everything again. Mm -hmm. For example, that is one use of snake make yeah. um, in contrast to coding that um, I'm just taking those from the input directory. Yeah. Okay. Or one advantage at least. Okay, here's my attempt at explaining. Let's see how they compare. So if your proper problem and project is small, then it really doesn't matter. Like if you can rerun everything in five seconds, then uh, you would just rerun everything you could go and write your own program that will look at all the inputs and all the outputs and then rerun only what's missing and that's fine the advantages of this kind of thing is that when your project may take say you know five days to run on a cluster then you can more easily do things like, okay, I'm modifying just this one file and I'm going to see what the difference is. And you check that and then you can rerun the whole thing by giving it another command. And you can go and you can write this all yourself in your Python script. Like you can say, okay, here's like 
look at all these inputs and then make these outputs and then do this final step. But people have found that sometimes these workflow managers, like a thing that can do all this for you, can be helpful. Um, is it, like at what, what point is the workflow manager worth it? It's really hard to say. Um, but I, I would say um, it starts being useful as um, soon as you don't want to rerun everything and you have increment and uh, potentially incremental data or uh, mm -hmm. things that don't depend on everything mm -hmm. that um, where you can have steps yeah. that don't need to be re re done yeah. and those steps might be expensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm switching back to my screen. Well, actually, there was this comment that uh, they like the talking less, give us more time, but more time explaining what stake make is. Um, I'm sorry about that. I tried to, but we just ran out of time. and It could have gone on forever. I hope that having some chance to read makes our wrap-up explanations a bit better. Should we go back and look at the snake file one last time and see if we understand it better now? So these rules like this. So it says inputs and outputs, which are files, and then it can make a big network of all of these files. So that way, if a certain file is um, changed. changed, it will know what needs to be updated. So it's like the, the, the difference between an imperative programming language, where one says what to do, and a declarative where one says, these are the steps, but we're letting the program figure out the right steps to rerun it. And the more complicated your problem gets, the more useful it is. OK, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. Um, so what are the key points here? So if you can manage something and set up a completely automated pipeline for your research where you can run one command, and it will find all of these steps and rerun them. Remember this horror story we started with at the beginning. So where um, the paper revisions came back and you had to change some things. So imagine how nice it would be if you could modify your code and then reactivate the same Conda environment with all the same software as one month or six months or however long ago, and then run one command, and then you get all of the plots out. Not just the data, but the plots themselves. Um, what I think what it, what it also does is essentially it is a part of documentation if you want it like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Because it tells you what steps are required for what. Yeah. So, OK. Yeah. And we don't think, I'm not claiming that every project needs a snake file, but it's a good tool to have. No, it's good to know of the idea. So when you start realizing that writing your own script to run your stuff is taking a bit too much effort, you can know when you might want to switch to one of these tools. And there's many beyond SnakeMake. You can look above for some references. So should we move on? Yep. The next part, if we go back to the main page, is uh, recording, recording environments. So here we're really going to just do this as a demo. So all of the um, the demos are over, or all the um, code alongs are over. 
you can try to do these as a type along, but it requires some extra stuff installed, which we haven't asked for. So maybe you want to just enjoy and, your and life. properly set up. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, just one minute. Yeah. Okay. So recording environments. So we talked a few lessons ago about this idea of recording your dependencies so you can make a conda environment. But what happens if you want to save that conda environment or even the whole operating system and then um, be able to reuse that? So this is yet another level of reproducibility. We had that discussion um, uh, in the HackMD where people couldn't uh, use uh, an, an export environment on a different operating system, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is like the next level. So containers are the solution for that. So a container, the way I describe it, is basically the entire operating system in a file. And then you can send this file to someone else to run the code just like you ran it. And since there's no communication from, well, little communication from inside the container to outside, it will always run the same. Of course, assuming that you're running on the same hardware and there's not hardware bugs and all kinds of things like that. And this is a very, really simplified view. So actually there's, it's a lot more complicated in order to um, be able to be efficient. And I think that's the reason why Docker became so popular as the first container platform. They found a way to distribute these images in a more lightweight form so they could be um, sent around and used for operational stuff. And yeah. But OK, so the two most popular things we, you might hear about are Docker and Singularity. So Docker, I think, was first made for things like um, services. Singularity was designed for computing. So basically designed to be run on clusters on your own computer, things like that. Singularity actually does store its images in single files. Docker uses um, these kind of operating system services to distribute stuff. But we're demonstrating Docker. OK. Docker is available for most operating systems. Um, it can run on most operating systems. Actually, I don't know. Can you run operating systems other than Linux inside of it? Maybe someone in mm -hmm. HackMD works. Um, there's the different kinds of repositories to share images. Um, so, OK. Let's take this example. Let's say you want to run RStudio. So you go and you find, you search on the web, RStudio Docker. And then you find, OK, it's in the repository rocker slash RStudio, which would be on Docker Hub. And it tells you this command to run it. So what does this mean? So it means Docker run. I'm going to remove the image the running container once it's done. This P means I want to be able to go from this port on my computer to the port in the image. So this basically routes the network, your web browser, into the image. This password is the password which is used to access RStudio. Uh, that, that is specific for this specific Docker image. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah. It essentially minus E um, indicating that uh, please set this environment variable in the mm. Docker container. Yeah. So, okay, let's give a demonstration. I'm switching to Thomas's screen. Yep, here we are. So he can copy so it. If, yeah, I can also copy it over. I will change the password to make it simpler. Um, because I don't want to type that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just have as password test. And if I run this, um, 
So, I already downloaded it uh, at some point, yeah. um, obviously. Um, normally, it would pull the image from uh, from Docker Hub. That would take a bit of time. Mm -hmm. Then it would start up the images. Um, and so, so not only does it run it, it automatically gets it for you, which yep. I guess is nice. OK. So and if I now go to localhost8787. So we can't see the title bar part, but I think that's OK. Uh, we went to the yeah. URL that's in the lesson material. It's fine. Uh, do you remember what the username was for that hmm. thing? I don't know. Um, Can you do there, test there and test? No, it, it was something. It something. Uh... Oh, login RStudio. Does it say so? In the material. Uh, all oh. lowercase. So, test. And password test. Nah. OK. And now here we're running RStudio. So this is not actually running on our computer. Well, it is, but that's sort of besides the point. It's running in this isolated environment. It's running on our computer, but it's not uh, in our operating system, kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or somewhat, yeah, contained in the, in the operating system. Yeah. OK. Um... Yeah, well, that's the demo. Is there anything else we should show? Can you show? Well, oh yeah, let, let's just go on, I guess. I mean, this is doing this kind of container thing in 10 or even 30 minutes is almost impossible. So we're trying to give you the biggest summary, and then you can read more yourself. So one of the other really interesting things is that these images are defined by text files, these Docker files. So basically, you it's like a script to make to set up the operating system and all software inside of it. So basically, if you do it right, the image becomes reproducible. reproducible. And that is actually an amazing change from the having to install everything yourself every time and remember all the commands you might be running. Yeah, so um, I've just run a quick look on what the environment is in here. And uh, for example, it shows me that there is a home R Studio R where my libraries are being located. Mm -hmm. This folder does not exist on my operating system. So okay. this is just inside the Docker container. Yeah. And the same so this all these all these folders um are pointing to the to inside the Docker container. Yeah. And it won't modify my own operating system. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay. Um so what's pros and cons of containers? The, the pros is that you really can uh, export a complete um, setup. So you really don't have, and, and it's a self-contained uh, setup. So you, you could potentially, yeah, throw in your, your versions uh, in all detail and you can run that on any operating system. So we are essentially solving the problem or we can solve the problem of um, this uh, does not. This does not work, uh, or this environment does not work on my machine because I have a different operating system. Um, if I am using a Docker container, well, it will work because the, this this is the uh, this is container. This is within its own kind of own virtual operating system. Yeah. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, work for me at least working with Docker is not simple um or well having a, fin a finished image and uh, using a tool with from docker that's fine but um working and building a docker container is not that simple um mainly because most tutorials that are around show a simple example which is normally not sufficient to what you want to do yeah okay that's at least yeah. my take <laughs> And my take is that it can be useful, but it can often hide software installation problems. Like the number of times I've found something that said, okay, this can't be installed, so 
use your um use our docker use image doc, which okay that might work in one case except for people that can't run docker because they can't install it or you need to combine it with some other thing that's also in a docker image so you end up having to hook two things together and mm -hmm. maybe even it can't be done because it has to run in the same process and I think that's basically what we'd like to say about container images. So this exercise, not everyone can do because we haven't asked you to install it. So yeah, I think we should go on. In HackMD, there's a lot of good questions here. Um, some are being answered, but I think for time purposes, we should go on and at the wrap up, we can look and see if any of these are relevant to look at again. Okay, back to my screen. So if we go to the main page again, next we go to sharing code and data. So what does it mean sharing code and data? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's like a very broad kind of thing. But here we're going to look at one particular type of thing as a demonstration. So if you have some code or data um, and you want it to be available for other people, what are the options? You can do things like email it to them. Not really great because you have to ask for it and it makes work for you. You can put it on your own website or university web space, but that's going down eventually and can't really be cited. Um, but then there's these concept of repositories like Zenodo, if you've heard of it. And the idea there is that you can upload data and you get a DOI digital object identifier, which means it can be cited and then, um, certain repositories like Zenodo are publicly funded. So they're basically commit to make your data available as long as possible, which really is the best we can do. We keep a copy, we let Zenodo keep a copy and, um, you know, permanent is a long time and Zenodo is the closest we can get to. So that's the idea here. So actually in the next lesson, which is going to start uh, quite soon, we're going to talk about more about open science and why we would share data. So let's save our time right now and try to get to the exercise itself. Fair principles. Okay, do the next lesson talk about fair principles. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. Okay, let's quickly mention them here. So this is something that has become popular in the last years. So the idea is that data should be findable, as in someone else can know it actually exists. It should be accessible, which means that once someone knows it exists, they can um, ask for it and get it. It should be interoperable, which means that it should be in some standard format, which can be reused easily. And reusable means there should be a license, which allows other, other people to reuse it. So interoperable depends on what your data is. Reusable is discussed in the next lesson, the licensing. But findable and accessible, that's what we're going to demonstrate. So let's come to this exercise, which is actually a type along, or actually it's a demo, but you can try to type along if you want. But for most of you, I would recommend to sort of watch and not worry too much. So what's the general idea here? Let's say you have a repository with some um, code to it. Nice and you want to make this code available to others. You want to be able to cite it. So you want this digital object identifier and you want it on Zenodo. 
So there's actually integration between Zenodo and GitHub. So you can tell Zenodo, okay, anytime there is a release of a project on GitHub, it will archive a new copy. Should we make it concrete by giving the demonstration? So I will switch to Thomas's screen here. So we're going to log in not to zenodo.org, but sandbox.zenodo.org, which is here. And Thomas is logging in with GitHub. OK. Um, are, is, is this your upload here? Nope. No, OK. Moy. OK, yeah. So after we're logged in, that is yeah, <laughs> that, that, that that is German, but uh, it's not my upload. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we want to upload something new, or actually, let's go to the settings under your user account here, the drop-down box. We're going to GitHub, and we will scroll down a little bit. And there's the switch that shows on and off. Do you want to turn it off and on again to demonstrate? Yep. Okay. So it's linked. And now if we look below, Zenodo sees the different repositories which Thomas has in GitHub. Can we find the word count repository here? Uh, probably. There we are. Yeah. So, okay, yep. we've flipped the switch. So now GitHub, because, no, Zenodo, because it's linked with GitHub, has gone and told GitHub, okay, whenever there's a new release here, please let me know. So we're pretending that this word count is our important code that we're going to release in our paper and we need a copy of. Of the data. Of the data that's in there. With the data being the source code and, well, I guess everything source code documentation, whatever. OK, so now can we go to GitHub and go to this repository? OK, so we're on word count. So we notice on the right side, there's this releases part here. So can we click there? Yep. So what's release? So a GitHub release is sort of like a tag, but um, but is I has slightly a little bit more GitHub data there. Hmm. Okay, we can create a new tag with some version number. Yep. So we're calling this v one point zero. So yeah, it should have been lowercase. Um. <laughs> okay. And we can give some description to this. Like this is very important research and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what happens if we click release now? So we can publish release. And you notice that GitHub here makes these assets, so the source code is downloadable, which it essentially takes nice. the version that is currently, or the the version that is um, of the uh, at this specific tag. Yeah. So now in the repository, we can go and find this tag version 1.0. Should we go back to Zenodo and see? Uh. Too much stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um. Do we see? Hmm. How can we see your uploads? Um. Bu 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 bu. Profile. Where are we? Hmm. I think there are a lot of people who have some work on um... <laughs> Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff here, but where yours is is another 
If you click upload, does it show yeah. your past uploads? Yeah. Um, well, I, I just searched okay, for my searching. name, so... Yeah, so let's click on this and let's see what benefits we get. So first off, it's a snapshot of the repository, the current versions of the files. Uh, if you look on the right side, we see it says DOI, which means that, well, this is a fake DOI because this is the sandbox, but it um, you can use this as a citation in your paper if you wanted to cite your software. Um, yeah. It shows me potentially different versions if there are different ones. I would assume. Yeah. Yes, it would show different versions, so you can see the older ones and newer ones. So why would we do this? Um, let, I'm going to come back to my screen now. First off, Zenodo is not alone. There's other um, platforms for doing this type of thing. Um, Zenodo is what we usually recommend as the general purpose place if you have no better repository. But if you have some domain specific repository, that is better. Um, there's also country specific repositories. Although personally, I would go with the international one and plenty more reading. So let's swap, swap to HackMD and do some wrap up here. So what did we just do? Like, what was the point of this little lesson? Hopefully so, we showed you. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so Go ahead. <laughs> if you want your work to be reproducible, people have to be able to find your code, your data, that type of thing. And to do that, you basically need to have a repository that is outside that's managed by someone else professionally. And this lets you do that. The extra benefit is that you can cite it and include it in your paper citations and things like that. Um, Zenodo is not alone. There's many other ones that you can use. But Zenodo is nice because it's publicly funded, has the DOIs, and has GitHub integrations. Also, we should point out you really don't need to use GitHub with this. You could go and upload the stuff yourself, especially if it's some data you wouldn't want in a Git repository. You can put it there. Um, yeah. Let's really wrap up the whole lesson. Uh, what did we learn here? So we started with this idea of reproducibility crisis, where other people can't do the same work you've done and get the same results. And oftentimes it's even worse than that. It might be you can't even get the same results that you had before. And this is an absolute disaster. There's no worse, worse feeling. So we've looked over different levels of making this better. So whether it's recording the versions of dependencies you need to run your stuff, recording the steps themselves, packaging the whole uh, workflow. Um, yeah. I think for me still the most important bit um, about m many of the things that we have said to, uh, today is um, they make your code your projects actually being usable and therefore having a much higher chance of actually being used because it's very often that if you if you see some code that has almost well where you don't even know how to run it where you don't have any idea what the dependencies are you just can't be bothered to even try to use it mm -hmm. you might you might re-implement from a paper yeah. If it's re, if it sounds really good, um, but reimplementation, yeah, is not what you want to achieve normally. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great question here. Can we trust Zenodo in the long run? 
So Zenodo is funded by the European Union. So I think of most of the services, it's one of the most likely ones to stay around. But also if the repository is right and there's open licenses, the data shouldn't just be in Zenodo, but other people can mirror it. So let's say Zenodo is going down. Because it's open data, then someone else can say, okay, we're going to go and make a copy and host this ourselves now. There was a great question up above about MATLAB and MATLAB versus open source things. So I'd recommend scrolling up and reading it yourself because there is um, a lot that was said up there. There were some main points here, which let's see, where did I write them? So once someone, I was in this meeting with someone and they made a point that, it's so okay, in my field, we have these big models of water flow. And if your model is not open source, then eventually someone else will come by and make an open source model. It will get more contributors and more users because they actually can. And then eventually your model will lose out because this other model has more people using it. So that's sort of the like philosophical benefit of open source. And I'd say as it, we've seen over the last 10 years, the, Python, the size of the Python community has really taken off and produced something um, much bigger. So someone did a test and there was one comment above about jobs using MATLAB. So LinkedIn jobs says 98 jobs include MATLAB in the result, Python 1,299. So it's pretty- That's clear. for Finland. That's, and that's just for Finland, yes. As the philosophical debate, um, if other people can't reuse the language without a license, is it actually reproducible? We can debate this all we want. Um, and then there were comments, is Python made by amateurs and MATLAB made by professionals? Well, no, I'd say there's <laughs> very many professionals working on Python. Just look at some, who some of the contributors to these projects are. The difference is that you pay someone with MATLAB if things go wrong. And on the other hand, they don't let you know how it works. So you actually can't verify it yourself. Well, with these open communities, there's this process of people checking. So just look at some of the projects like NumPy or SciPy and see how verified they are. Okay, we're a little bit past our expected break time. Are there any final wrap-ups we should talk about? I think we're fine. Yeah. Okay, so should we go to a break until one minute, uh, no, 16 minutes past the hour? And then we will go to social coding. So see you soon. Continue asking in HackMD and we will consider answering. Bye.